morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning. It's great to see you. We're going to get started in just a second. Really good to see you this morning. And I uh, want to welcome you to church as you come in. And uh, gonna... oh, hello. We've got some feedback. Got some feedback. Got to watch where I stand, obviously. Um, I'm all right over here, hopefully. No, I'm not. I was. No, I am now. But I'm just going to stand behind here instead then, shall I? Why wasn't this doing this before? Very weird. Okay. It's really good to see everybody and uh, welcome to church. We had uh, an absolutely fantastic... Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. 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 The weird thing about up here is we can't hear how loud or quiet we are. It's, it's, uh, we need, need to get some, some fault back and things like that sorted out. It really is great to see everybody and to, uh, to welcome you here uh, this morning to church. We had an absolutely brilliant evening last night. Um, uh, comedy night raising money for Hope Uganda and uh, really enjoyed that evening and it was great to have uh, Andy Kind, comedian with us and it's great to have him here this morning as well. He's also a great preacher and he will be preaching in our service this morning and it's really great to have you with us Andy. Uh, in the spirit of the fact that we've been doing comedy, why don't you just greet a few people around you, welcome them, and hey, why not tell them a joke? Off you go. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Ah, uh, there you go, then. <laughs> Fantastic. I love the fact that when you do this, when you get people to go and talk to one another, it's then, it's then really, really hard to gather them all back together again. That's a good sign, I think. That's a good sign. And it's great to see everybody. Did, did anybody hear any good jokes? Can't hear me. Okay, Rob, we're not on. Are we on now? Okay, fantastic. Did anybody hear any good jokes? Yeah? No, Go on, I'm kind of shut you out. How do you make an egg roll? I drink a lot. An egg roll? You push it. <laughs> okay. Just, just so you know, just so you know. Oh, go on at the back. I've been told the jokes to do with my name. Go on. What do you call the Frenchman wearing sandals? Philippe 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 Philippe. Love it. Okay. Oh, I've, got to I've, got, I've got to join in. When I got to this church, I was very pleased to find that we're just a single story building because I've never trusted stairs. If you ask me, they're always up to something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it, I don't know if it I 
deserve that. Right, OK. <laughs> Whether it was that good. Miriam we are going to begin... We are going to... Hey, sorry. Miriam had a joke. Miriam. Sorry? You had a you joke. Had a joke. Yeah, I'm not saying it, though. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. No, we're going to come to our first... We're going to come to, to, to praise and worship. Uh, our first song is uh, on a video. So it's a, kids, it's, a, it's a kids family song with some action. So I encourage you, if you are willing and able and comfortable, to stand up and to copy the action on the screen as you sing. It's called Move. It's not the same song move that we often do. It's a different one. So uh, let's let's stand if you're if you're willing and able and let's do this song together. Fantastic. <laughs> Let's sing 
you are to do all things. We praise your name. We glorify you today, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord, that there is power. Power in your name. We worship you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Anyone who needs to know your power, the power of your name speaking and working into their lives right now. We speak the name of Jesus, the power of the name of Jesus over every situation, over every hurt, over every pain, over every struggle, over every disappointment. 
We speak the name of Jesus over those things. We declare that your name is powerful. We declare your name is strong and we declare that your grace is enough. And we thank you, Lord, for the, that is the truth. And we stand upon it. And we speak your powerful name into each of our lives and into each of our situations. Trust in you because you are such a good God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please take your seats. We are going to uh, pray for our kids as they go out to, uh, to their session next door. Uh, or rather straight through the corridor in the coffee shop. Let's pray for them um, right now. Father God, we just want to thank you for our young people, for our children. We praise you for them, Father God. We believe and, and dream, Father God, over them. Greatness in your kingdom. Greatness from you. Oh, Lord, all that you want to do in their lives, we, we, we Lord God, welcome and ask you to come upon them and to, to meet with them. Father, and as they go out to their session, Father God, go with them. Father God, and by your spirit, guide and anoint everything that he's done and said. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Fantastic. Before we worship again, um, I'm going to do some notices. Okay. And then we'll sing again as we move uh, towards our time of communion. Okay, so there are a number of notices and I'm bound to forget one of them. So uh, looking around the room for people that will, uh, that will help me and that will, uh, that will remind me of them as we go. But um, the very first thing that I actually want to do is to talk about the notices themselves, okay, which sounds a little bit weird, okay, um, but I really, really want to kind of just, just, just do that and just clarify um, how they work, uh, particularly because with this one, I think I may have left things a little bit unclear and a little bit confusing on them. You're not at all surprised by that, are you? Which is disappointing, but there we are. Uh, <laughs> but, but typical. Okay, so here we go. This is going to sound a little bit laboured, sorry. Okay, at the top of the notices, okay, is, is the, the date of the Sunday that they refer to, okay? So today is the 22nd of October, and it's on there, okay? And, uh, and then, so you'll notice that this one has got two dates, and that's what I'm going to come on to in just a bit. But uh, you'll notice that that that's what the Sunday date is, and that's really where the uh, the idea of the week begins from. Okay, and uh, you'll notice then that um, there are a number of kind of uh, boxes giving information and and details. This is all new, and you're all looking at me really weird. As if say, why are you doing this? Okay, why are you doing this, Pete? I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I'm doing this. Now. Okay, okay, because. Sometimes there's a little bit of confusion, okay? Because we have these little boxes that say, this week, okay? And what we do is we email, in order to give you pl plenty of kind of warning in plenty of time, <coughs> plenty of notice, we send out these kind of usually about Wednesday or Thursday by email. Sometimes it's a bit later than that, but we aim to get them out uh, every Wednesday or Thursday, okay? And so, it is possible, therefore, that when people receive the, the notice sheet on a Wednesday, they look at it and they say, oh, this week. So for example, daytime, home life, daytime life group is happening Friday, 10 a.m., okay? Um, uh, prayer day is this Saturday, okay? And it's possible that you might get this through on Wednesday and think, oh, it's happening in two days' time, okay? It's not. Okay, the way it works is that it works from the day, the Sunday, at the top. And so when it says that it's not, the, actually it's not this week, this week means Next after week. the week after Sunday. Okay, and so we are going to clarify that because it is a little bit confusing um, by, um, just, uh, by, by just starting to put the dates on there as well, which I think will, will just help matters. Okay, and... Um, and, and, I, and I've begun to say all this because, particularly because, as I said, this week I think I've actually created 
additional confusion for people. And that's, <laughs> and that's because um, we'll actually, I'll actually be on leave um, for a good part of next week, and therefore I decided this, this as in as in starting, yeah, as in, yeah, thanks, Dave. I mean, which week are you talking about, Dave? As in, we're Sunday now, so actually this week, okay, so starting tomorrow. Um, and so what I decided to do was to actually have a go at, um, at producing one set of notices for the two weeks, okay, and um, actually kind of, I think that that's, as I read it back, it just, it just confused me, and I'd written the thing, um, so I kind of figured, you know, I really ought to give some sort of explanation to you guys. What hope have we got? What hope have you got if I'm confused? <laughs> exactly. You know, I've been saying this for years, you know. Um, right, okay, so, um, so basically, ha, where it says this week on here, it is referring to this immediate week, as in starting today and continuing on. So daytime home group, uh, life group rather, is, is happening this Friday, is that right? Yes, this Friday. Um, prayer day is happening this coming Saturday, okay. But then, then obviously it's for two weeks, it's also for the, for the following week, and I thought, okay, well that'll be all right, I've simply put next week for that and then realise that actually that might create confusion. So, kind of, so, so, not next week, but the week after, for example, we have reflective prayer. Okay, are you with me? No, no. I'm making this worse, aren't I? Yeah? Okay, all right. So basically, what I'm gonna say, what I'm saying is, if you get confused by this, Pray. Just send a message. Pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we will try and send something that will just clarify matters because we we've got the reflective prayer happening not this week but next week. We've also made no mention of the life groups, evening life groups, and the crew life group that would be happening that week, which of course we normally would. So we will send some some clarification. So um, so yeah. Um, as I say. Pete, we still love you. Yeah. I really have, haven't I? I've got, you know, the, the material is, unbe is unbelievable. Okay, so what, what I'm going to say, we will clarify this. We will, um, we will make this a bit clearer. But just be aware that you could get confused by this. <laughs> if you haven't already. There we go. Do you know what? <laughs> turn, turn, turn to the person next to you and say, well, if he hasn't got a clue what he's talking about, we've got no chance. Yeah. <laughs> we are, however, going to talk about um, a couple of the, uh, the events that are happening um, this week. One thing that is for this week, this immediate week, that's not mentioned on the notices is um, we have a worship practice on Wednesday. Is that right, Graham? I'm going to clarify that I've got, you know, I've created so much confusion, I'm clarifying as I go. Okay, so this Wednesday at 7.30, um, we are meeting, uh, oh God, I'm not here, but a group of people are meeting here um, for a worship practice, okay? And anyone who would like to come along is welcome to come along to that. It's not a heavy thing. It's not like a, 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 a big deal. It's just getting together and singing together or practicing together and getting some, some, some idea of, um, of some worship together. So if you feel like actually worship might be your thing and it might be something that you want to get involved in and, and that you, you, you might want to kind of to check out, you're, you're welcome on Wednesday. Is that right, Graham? That is absolutely welcome uh, to come along 7.30 on Wednesday, and that will be brilliant. Is that, now, this, is that this Wednesday? That's this Wednesday. That's this Wednesday. Wednesday the 25th. Thank you. See, that worked. Okay, and then uh, and then this coming Saturday, six days time. Okay, is our prayer day. So I'm going to ask Wendy to come and talk a little bit about that. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, there you go. Oh, no. In March, 
Al and I went on one of our uh, prayer retreats and we had an awesome, profound experience or an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Al was weeping, I was pacing up and down think, thinking my spirit was just going to explode. And then we just realised that we needed to share what we'd experienced with you guys here in church. But we just waited to, to hear more about what that content would be. The end of September, we went on uh, another retreat just to get more sense of what it was going to be like. Um, so this prayer day is falling out of those experiences that we had. Now when I say prayer day, this is not a prayer meeting that's lasting all day. We're not all sitting around in a circle praying. It's an interactive space where you can encounter God on a personal level. As you walk around the room and uh, engage with the different stations that will be set up, it's between you and God what you experience. But we pray that as you come in through this, the doors, that you will experience the awe of God and his presence. And what it is, it is joining together the Old Testament and the New Testament and bringing it up to relating to our lives as they are at the moment and where we pray that your lives will go on from there in God. <coughs> so I do encourage you to, to come along. It's nine o'clock till six and beyond. Um, just come for however long you want and just do what you feel led to do um, in this room and all I can say is that Al and I are overwhelmed and humbled and privileged to be putting this together for God and for you guys. So please, please do come along and receive from God. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Fantastic. Let's worship again, shall we? as we uh, move towards the time of communion.
sing this next song, we'll distribute the, uh, the emblems if that's okay.
ചെയ്യേണ്ടത് Father God, we want to thank you for Jesus and that he was the Lamb of God. We thank you that he gave his very life for us, that he bore the pain and the suffering and the humiliation and the shame of Calvary for us. And because of that, as that song declares, it has become a beautiful sight for us, that he, that the Lamb of God, would die in our place and take upon himself our sin. We worship you. We praise you. And by remembering this today, Lord, we again declare that you are our Lord. We will follow you. Lord God, we belong to you. In Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he broke it, he said, take it eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Let's share it together. And in the same way he took the cup. And when he blessed it he said take it drink. This is my blood shed for you in promise. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's share it together. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you're now no longer on the cross, but enthroned in glory. And we worship you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as said, it is absolutely fantastic to have Andy Kind back with us again. He had a great time. Oh, gone off. <laughs> Somebody's obviously decided that had enough of me. All right, okay. Um, it's been a great evening last night. Such fun and laughter. Everyone had such a great time, and it was just so, so, so brilliant to do it and to. Uh, to also be, of course, uh, reminding ourselves about the fantastic work that Hope Uganda does and uh, having that opportunity just to raise money for that and to, uh, to kind of continue to support the work that's happening in that place of which, you know, this church is very, very much invested. Those of you who are not aware, Hope Uganda is a charity that was founded um, by members of this church um, uh, past and present and uh, it's so great of course where are they? I don't know where they've gone to have Roy and Sue with us, where are they? Oh you're there, you're there have you fallen out or something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, to, uh, to have them, them with us Roy and Sue were part of the church and, uh, and it's great to, to have them with us again and, uh, and to have them joining with us uh, this morning. Great to see you as well, Ron. Really nice, lovely to see you. Um, but we're going to invite uh, and welcome Andy as he comes up today to bring God's Word. Okay, so Andy, it's fantastic to see you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that he will bless you and anoint you and use you as we know he will and that you'll be blessed 
um, as you share. And so it's great to see you. Let's welcome Andy as he comes and shares with you. Hard copy of a Bible. Do you have like a, a, a hard Bible? Anybody got a Bible? I've got a, I've got hard a... copy. Yeah, well, yeah, look, there's one. That'd be great. I just need to borrow it. Come down and get it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Andy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all the same words, isn't it? Usually. Well, it is. It's just... I have my Bible on my phone, but my battery's very low, which is you know, quite traumatic for me. Um, Anyway, here we go. So it's lovely to be uh, back with you and see so many people. Uh, I was here this time last year. The church has grown since then, so congratulations on being amazing. Um, I'm looking for Isaiah. Old Testament. Yes, Old Testament. <laughs> so last year, if you remember, I think this is what I spoke on. Last year, I think I spoke on uh, the Apostle Peter. Is that, I spoke on the fall and rise of the Apostle Peter. I spoke on redemption and how uh, even after everything that Peter had done, he was a coward and a failure uh, and a liar. And Jesus met him on the beach. After all of that, after he betrayed Jesus, and, and Jesus said, um, come and have some breakfast. The point was that we are never beyond the point of redemption. And there is one being in the universe who never discredits, never downgrades, never disqualifies us, no matter what we do, and, it, and it's Jesus. He's the only person in the universe who, under any circumstances, wouldn't turn you away. Every other person in the universe, under the wrong circumstances, would turn their back on you. But Jesus never would. So even after Peter abandoned him at the cross and betrayed him, Jesus' response to that wasn't to gaslight him or to give him Stockholm Syndrome or to say, how could you do this? Or to say, trust takes time to rebuild. All he said was, come and have breakfast. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you, Lord. Well, let's go for it then. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's the last the, the summary. I mean, it was going quite well then. I might just do the talk from last year again. <laughs> but uh, no. <laughs> So this is the sequel, if you like, and I'm going to uh, just read you something um, about you. Okay, now don't get, uh, don't get anxious about it. I'm going to qualify what I mean by that in a second. So th I, want you to, I want you to understand that this is about you, and I want you to listen to it as though it's about you, as though it's a direct prophetic word over your life. Okay? Can't have that enough. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like the he doesn't like charismatic stuff. Um, here we go. This is about you, my friends. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you because the Lord has anointed you to preach good news to the poor. He has sent you to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, that is uh, about you, my friends. Obviously, it's Isaiah 61, and it's primarily about the co prophesies the, the coming of Jesus. But because it's about him, now it's also about you. Now, what we're not saying is that the Bible is your autobiography. We are not saying you are somehow the Lord. Everyone is God. We're not saying that. But what we're saying is that we, the moment we say yes to Jesus, we become a part of this narrative. We become co-heirs. Co-heirs. We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And it's the same inheritance that is given to Jesus. We are co-heirs. So what I want to be really clear on, because this is one of the things that has changed my life. One of the things that, it, becoming a Christian, so believing in God didn't change my life very much. And, and that's, I think, biblical as well, because lots of people believe, most people, if you get down to brass tacks, at some point in their life, most people say, well, I do believe in something. 
when you really get down, there are very few actual hard atheists. Everyone believes in something. And then it's a question of what they believe in. But believing in God doesn't do very much in and of itself. It doesn't change anything. The, the book of James says, you believe in God. Great. Even the demons believe in God. Yeah. Like, the demons believe in God. Absolutely. And they tremble. Yes. Believing in God doesn't change your life. It just doesn't change your life. So when people say, oh, I've got a faith, and they mean I believe it, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's meaningless. It doesn't help. It gives you a sense of self-entitlement. Maybe it gives you a sense of maybe everything will be okay in the end. And, and maybe it will be okay in the end. But it actually won't change your day-to-day -day life. Because even the demons believe in that. If you say you believe in God, great. So, I mean, the reality is that the demonic realm has a better theology than Pete Howard. Could be true. Yeah, very, no, it's just yeah, true. Very likely. They understand more about the spiritual than we do. Yes. I'm not going to go, I'm not just saying no, no, it's you, because really. you're bad. No, no, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Understand knowledge, knowledge about who God is, knowledge that there is a God, it doesn't make any difference to your life. What makes a difference is living as though the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is the central point of the universe. What changes your life is understanding that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. Amen. That's what changes your life. That's what changed my life. When you start to understand that the Bible isn't lying about these things, when the Bible says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, it's telling the truth. And the thing stopping us from living that out, and we'll come to this in a second, is that we choose to believe other things above that. Um, what, is, what would you say is the biggest problem? You don't have to have a, you don't have to shut up. But what would you say is the biggest problem for the UK church? Anyone want to have, just what comes to mind? I would say, what's the biggest problem for the UK church? Apathy. Hypocrisy could be that, yeah, lots of things. Apathy. Apathy. Yes, exactly right. You've nailed it this morning. You told me a joke. You've been on the organ. Now you're shouting out from the back. <laughs> the, the problem for the UK church is not, is not the unbelief of the unbelievers. It's the unbelief of the believers. That's our problem. Yeah. Do you know, there are more people. There are about three times as many people in this room than how Christianity started. Christianity started with 11 terrified blokes in a functioning room above a pub. <laughs> it was, I think it was like the Red Lion or something like that. But it started with, th with 11 terrified blokes who up until very recently had decided that they'd ruined everything, they got it wrong, they'd been duped. And they saw something and they more importantly, they chose something that started a chain of events which has led to us all being here today. Whatever you think about the truth of Christianity, if those 11 men, and of course all the other men and women who were sort of, you know, in their gang, but if those 11 terrified people hadn't decided that they were going to live in a different way, that they were really going to proclaim the gospel, that they weren't going to live in fear, we, we just wouldn't be here today. Because the news wouldn't have spread. So what's really encouraging, apart from the fact that there's more people here than when I preached last year, which is encouraging in itself, but there's about three times many more people in this room than when Christianity started. And it's the same Holy Spirit. And that should excite you. Yeah. That should excite you about All Sager. Yeah. There's not a lot to be excited about All Sager, I know that. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> That's not true, it's lovely. I'm very fond of it, but... There, I did some research one. There, there were... Uh, 13,500 people, according to the last census, who, uh, census not sentence, uh, who live in Old Sager. Let's say there are 50, let's say there are 50 active members, it's probably a bit conservative, but let's say there are 50 active members of Old Sager Community Church. Do you know that if, if every one of you had one, had spent five minutes a week it's alright, we'll just uh, break for a news headline. All <laughs> <laughs> Sager named greatest city in the world. <laughs> 13,500 people in Old Sager. 
uh, 50 active people in this church. If every one of you spent five minutes a week having one conversation a week with someone you didn't know about Jesus, or someone you didn't know about Jesus, and assuming all of those people were different, in five years' time, everyone in Old Sager would have heard the gospel. And that's just you. That's just people in this church. Now, of course, it's not. You're not all going to have... Some of you might have the same conversation with different people. But the, the point is... The Great Commission is not completely off script. The Great Commission is not actually out of our reach. Now we cannot, we cannot control how people respond to the Gospel. As God says to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 2, I'm sending you to the house of Israel, and whether they listen or refuse to listen, because they're a rebellious nation, nation, they will know that they've had a prophet amongst them. What God doesn't say to Ezekiel is, I'm sending you here, Ezekiel, because I'm God and I'm in charge and I know what's going to happen. Everything's going to be great. He doesn't say that. He says, you go and do what you're told, which is just to talk, talk about me, tell people that I love them. Yeah. And then whether they listen or refuse to listen, you'll have done your job. We, overcom we overcomplicate evangelism. We, we massively overcomplicate it. We feel like we have to share, like... This is why God exists and stuff. Sharing the gospel isn't telling people why God exists. Mm -hmm. That's called apologetics, and that's great as well. But that's not sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is simply giving somebody something true about Jesus that builds on what they previously thought. Mm. That's sharing the gospel. If you can tell somebody something good and true about Jesus that is better than the story they've been living out, you have shared the gospel. Yeah. Do you know what? Going up to someone in a cafe in the Costa across the road, for instance, and saying, hey, you looked a bit sad. I just want to let you know that, that God really loves you and there's hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah. You shared the gospel. Congratulations, you shared the gospel. Oh, I love you. Thank you. I, I don't feel the same. But, um, <laughs> but I'd like to be friends. <laughs> It is, no, it's true. What we're trying to do, what we're trying to do, because we we live in a society like we are one of the, we do live in one of the most godless societies that the world has ever seen, the most secular society. Like, so what? We that's this is where we've been put. Do you know that bit in the film Zulu where there's that private who says to the color sergeant, "Why, why is it us, eh? Why is it us?" And the colour and says, well, because there's no one else here, lad. <laughs> you are where you are. The Lord knows where you are. Maybe, you, maybe we're not going to see the stuff that we would have seen in the 1960s or post-war. Maybe we're not going to see the sort of great revivals of the past. But it, you do you. you. You work on having your own little mini-revival. And going up to somebody in Costa or somebody in, in <laughs> Astor or baking a cake for your neighbour in love and showing them and telling them why you're doing it. That's the, that's the seed of revival. There will be people, let me put it this way, I think this is true. There are people who have not yet been born who will find you in heaven and thank you for what you shared with their ancestors. There will be people in heaven who will be there because you chose to bless somebody instead of stay silent. That's true. And again, what we're not, what I'm not saying is, you have to go and boldly proclaim the gospel. You have to boldly tell people that they're going to hell. You have to boldly say repent and believe. That's not going to work. What works <coughs> is showing them more love, more kindness, dis displaying more peace and more joy than the people around them. Give them a better story. Give them our story. What we're not, we don't preach ourselves. We don't go and say, look, if you change some of your behavior, you could be just like me. That's religion. That's moralism, legalism. All we're ever doing when we're sharing the gospel is say, look, I'm, I'm pretty battered as well. I'm pretty wounded as well. You know, I've really found hope in this person of Jesus. I've really found hope in this idea that 
ultimately death doesn't get to win. Despair doesn't get to win. Addiction doesn't get to win. <coughs> There's something good about that. And all we need to do is, is, remove, is remove that expectation, like have high expectations of God and low expectations of yourself. You're probably not very good. I used to work, I used to work uh, for a church as a professional evangelist. In the first six months of, uh, no, first three months of me working for this church, as an evangelist, I was being paid to share the gospel, to grow the church. In the first three months of me working for the church, the church attendance dropped by 25%. <laughs> there was a point there back in 2019 where I was statistically the worst evangelist in the UK. And I may still be, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not about you. It's not about trying to do it well. You could mess up, and some of you will. You could mess up every conversation you have about Jesus for the rest of your life. You could come away from every conversation, oh, I meant to say that thing that I'd heard J. John say, or whatever. I meant to say, I read this thing, you're very clever, I wanted to share this. But you could come away from every conversation and, and leave the people you tried to share the gospel with looking absolutely confused and annoyed and looking like they want to bottle you. You could do that. And God, when it's your day to go home, the Lord will meet you and he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. He will say that. Because he's not interested in your ability. He couldn't care less. He's not running an organisation. There are no league tables in heaven. There's no hierarchy of goodness. There's Jesus and everyone else. He just wants your availability. And the call to be a disciple, the call to uh, and you, anyone who's anyone who's tried to share the gospel knows that sharing the gospel has a very low batting average. Most of the people I share the gospel with are still not Christians. Some of the people I share the gospel with were Christians and are not Christians anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really good at communication. I mean, I, I'm, world, I'm a world-class communicator and I'm terrible at evangelism. Everybody is. No one's, no one's that good. No, one, no one's very good. But it doesn't matter because it's not about you. It's about sharing God's heart with the heart of other people. So... The Spirit, let's, listen, let's read this again and, and start to believe it now. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on you. It's on you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. <coughs> the Lord has anointed you. Do you know what anointed means? This is brilliant. Do you know what the word anointed means? It means to smear with ability. That's what anoint means. When you're saying, God, anoint me, what you're saying is, smear me with an ability I didn't have before. Whatever that is. Smear is a weird word, isn't it? But he's basically, he's basically saying, like, smear me with, with something I didn't have. Cover me with something I didn't have. He's anoint, he has smeared us with the ability to preach the good news. Whether we believe it or not, he has smeared us with the ability to preach the good news. <coughs> he has sent us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners. What he doesn't say is he sent us to go and tell people off. He sent us to go and tell people that they're wrong and we're right. He sent us to go and tell people to change their behaviour. You know, people are brokenhearted, and you, uh, you know this. I mean, you're brokenhearted. In some area of your life, you're, you're, you're pretty wounded. I know I am. And everyone you meet is pretty wounded and brokenhearted. And what you don't say, well, for instance, what you, what you don't say to uh, a single mum with three kids who, was walked, who, who had her partner walk out on her, and now she's walk, working two jobs to just try and get enough money, and she goes to food banks every week. What... What you don't say to her to bind up her broken heart is, you need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you'll be in trouble. Which, if you don't mind me saying, is the old school evangelical way of sharing the gospel. I'm not saying it didn't work, I'm just saying it's not appropriate for her. 
because the gospel isn't just isn't just a trap. The gospel is wide and broad and vast and true. The great thing about the gospel is that it has managed to impact every single culture and society that there's ever been. We just need to find the way of doing it, of funneling it. We don't. We're not there to make people's lives worse. We're there to give them good news. Mm, that's right. Not good advice. You can give people good advice as well, but first give them good news. Because religion gives you good advice. Religion says, the religious mindset says, if I do A, B, and C, then X, Y, and Z can happen. So if I live a good life, maybe God will love me. The gospel is the opposite. The gospel is good news. News is, X has happened. It's happened. It's not conditional on me doing something. It has happened. And now I'm learning about it, and all I have to do is respond to it. In the same we see what's going on in Gaza. We have, we're not responsible for that, but we have a choice to respond to it in some way. Or whatever the news is. You hear a friend's in trouble. How would you respond to that? And the way to respond to the gospel, and ultimately there are two ways to respond to the gospel. Um, to say yes to it or to say no to it. <laughs> That ultimately you will say one of two things to Jesus at some point in your life and maybe at the end of your life you will either say Jesus you are my king and I want to come into your kingdom or you will say I am the king or queen of my life Jesus at which point the Lord will say okay your majesty have it your way I shall leave your kingdom but bear in mind that I am love and light and life and when I go these things go as well you remove love you get disconnection, you remove light, you get darkness, you remove life, you get death. That sounds a lot like hell to me. We're trying to get people into relationship with Jesus. We're just trying to get people closer to Jesus. It's not very successful, but it is easy. Telling people that God loves them, sharing your heart, what he's done in your life, it is easy. It might be scary. We don't do it, not because it's not easy, but because we don't succeed very often. But once you understand that it's not about you, once you understand that the Lord will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, once you understand that you don't have to be evangelist of the week, once you get out of the way and let God do what he does, what he wants to do, that's when it becomes a joy. I used to go out in Chesterfield sharing the gospel on the street, and I, was all, I would always be terrified. Until I'd had that first conversation. Until I'd gone up to that one person and said, Hey, I just, um, I'm from a local church, Redeemer King. I just want to let you know, we're just going around today letting people know that, that God really loves them and wondering if we can pray for something for you. Once I'd had that first conversation, you go from being terrified to feeling invincible. Because you realise nothing, the worst thing that's going to happen is that they say, No, thank you. <laughs> or leave me alone. That's the worst that's going to happen. The best that's going to happen is that you see hope rise in their eyes. And you see that what you said has landed. I, was, I, was, I went up to this um, when I was in Huddersfield. I'll come back to that because this is the point I want to make. If you haven't been sent to bind up the broken hearted of old Sager, if you haven't been sent to proclaim freedom for the captives, if you haven't been sent to preach the good news to all Sager, who else is going? Who else is going? If it's not us, who is it? The NHS isn't going to bind up the broken hearted. They don't have enough bandages to bind up arms. This is our commission. And it's not it's not the same as an order because God isn't a factory owner or a sergeant major or a headmaster. He's our father and he wants the best for us and he loves us. But he loves the people who don't yet know him. He knows them already, but he loves the people who don't yet know him. And he wants them to have exactly the same opportunities that we've had to understand how much he loves us. Because there's, not, there's nothing, as you know, most of you, there's, there's nothing quite like knowing that you're loved unconditionally. 
There's nothing like that. And what we're trying to do is share that ultimate story of, of the fact that at the centre of the universe is a personal being who loves everybody unconditionally. So the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on you. He has sent you into all Saviour. You have got this commission. You are wearing the livery clothes of the Lord. You are wearing the suit of arms of the kingdom of God. It is you. You have been sent. Amen. You have that authority. Yeah. You have that permission. You won't win every battle. You will take some wounds. But you carry that authority. You are there to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Favour and grace and love. And the reason we don't do that, as I say, is because we always... We choose to believe other things above it. Satan, however you want to describe your spiritual enemy, however you want to name it, Satan or, or the devil, or if you don't want to personalise it too much, God calls Satan Satan, so I mean he's fairly clear on it, I think, but you don't have to visualise it in a certain way. But however you want to describe your spiritual enemy, you know that you, you, know that you have one. <laughs> You know that love isn't the only power in the universe. Satan cannot rewire the universe. Your spiritual enemy cannot rewire the universe. He cannot change the fact that the God of creation loves you unconditionally and came to find you in your lostness and your brokenness and offered to die on your behalf and then proved it by doing it. He cannot change the fact that Jesus died for you so that death and all of its minions couldn't have dominion over you. Satan can't change that fact. He can't rewire the universe. What he can do is rewire your mind and get you to rewire your mind. And this is what he does with huge success. He helps that he gets us to gaslight ourselves. He make, he, all he, his only aim, his only aim for the last 2,000 years has been to get human beings to elevate other beliefs yeah. above the belief that Jesus has got us. That's what addiction is, of course. It's a rewiring of the mind. It's a rewiring of the neural pathways. People, people don't get into addiction because they're naughty. People get into addiction because they're in pain. People have mental health issues because they ultimately, I think ultimately, originally because they were told a lie that has just taken root. And the Bible says that the bitterness is like a root. Well, anxiety is like a root. Fear is like a root. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Satan is the father of lies, and all he does is tell lies but he's very good at it. Because we're, we're not very good at protecting our minds. The great thing about, if you're a Christian in this room, the great thing is that although your body's going to die, your soul is safe, so that's good. Or your renewed body, but you know what I mean. Your, your physical body's gonna die, but your soul is safe. The battleground is your mind. And that's what Satan goes after. With addiction, with anxiety, with self-harm, it's all—it's it, not physical stuff. It's—it's—it's it's, it's in the mind. And people get into addiction because they can't cope with reality. Drinking isn't for someone who's an alcoholic. Drinking isn't their problem. Life is their problem. Drinking is their, is their solution. They're not just being naughty. It's the same with anything. And what we're not saying is, oh, if only they believed the truth. We're not—we're not saying that. Because ultimately, you become your choices, and it's very difficult to go back. Not impossible, but what we're, we're not—we're simply not condemning people. What we're saying is, the process starts with a lie, and Satan is the father of lies. And so, our commission, our commission as Christians, is to go and start to tell people that lovely, beautiful, gentle truth yeah. that starts to unpick some of the lies in people's lives. Yeah. Not to get them to simply. Stop drinking or stop smoking or stop gaming. It doesn't work like that. 
but to give them that better story and to walk with them as they walk back towards that better story. I think, uh, I think, Satan can't rewire the universe, but he can rewire your mind. So how, so to sort of, yeah, to finish. And, and people say, Mind, mindfulness, oh, mind, yeah, I use a lot of mindfulness, but you know what mindfulness is, it's basically controlling, you know, centering yourself on your thoughts to sort of, you know, block out stuff. And that, you know, that works to a degree, it's true with a small t, but you actually don't need, it's too eastern, it's too far too eastern. You actually don't need to look beyond the New Testament to, to engage with real mindfulness, it's all in there. Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of what? Mind. Your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <coughs> John chapter 8, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What he doesn't say is, you'll have an experience at a Christian festival and you'll become a Christian until you have a very bad experience and that overrides the very good experience. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you will feel the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Romans 8, Paul says, think of yourselves as dead to sin. Guess what? The great news is you are dead to sin. Sin has no hold on you. So think about it that way. James 1, consider it pure joy when troubles come. It doesn't say, when troubles come, you'll probably think, oh, this is proper race. I can't wait to be overwhelmed by these troubles. Because that's not how we feel when bad things happen. If I lose my TV remote, I absolutely fly off the handle. I don't know what's, who's taking it. Consider it pure joy. Change your mind. That's what repentance means. It means change your mind. Change your mind and turn around. And we become our choices. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way we do that is, there was, I can't remember who it was, but someone said, Satan, the only thing that scares Satan is people praying and reading their Bibles. Satan doesn't care about clever Christians or performance-based Christians or active Christians. He hates it when we choose to believe what God says. So if you want mindfulness, you just need to, you read the Bible and you, and you start to understand that it's, you're in this story. You're in this story. Read it and put yourself in it. So there's that bit again in Romans 8. Romans 8 1 says, There is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. What if you started to believe that was true about you, if it was really true about you, not just a theory, not just true for the people in the Bible or you know the better Christians that you know? What if you walked around knowing that however wrong you got things, there really was no condemnation in Christ Jesus? What if you really walked around knowing that nothing could separate you from the love of God? Nothing. What if you actually put yourself... Is it 8.38, that one? Something? Romans 8.38? What if you actually left here today choosing to believe, not waiting to feel... But choosing to believe that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I could be hit by a traction engine later on and nothing would separate me from the love of God. I could get shouted at by my best friend and nothing can separate me from the love of God. I, can, I could fire a shotgun into a cow and nothing can separate me from the love of God. I'm not saying you should do any of these things. <laughs> the point is there, is, there is no exception to the things that can't separate you from the love of God. The one person in the universe who loves you unconditionally will never leave you and never forsake you. Nothing can change that. That's why we call it the gospel, because it's good news. It's good news. He knows everything about you and he never turns you away. He knows everything. He knows your, he knows your darkest thoughts. He knows your history. He knows what you say, but he knows what you think about people. And he says, I love you. <laughs> I love you unconditionally. It's ridiculous. But it's true, and it's good. And it's what people need to hear. So put yourself in. Galatians 4, 6 and 7. 
You are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters. If you're struggling with something, uh, addictive personality, you're going to continue to struggle, but it's going to be less of a struggle if you choose to believe that you are actually, in God's sight, no longer a slave, but a son and a daughter, a co-heir. Your anxiety isn't going to go away magically, but it's going to, it's going to be helped by the fact, if you, if you read the Psalms where it says, in his presence is fullness of joy, and you choose to believe that, and you choose to get into his presence, it will help. It's not magic, but it's helpful. <laughs> in the same way, when you've, got a phys- when you've got a physical injury, you go to the hospital and you get a diagnosis, and you get a prognosis, and then you get treated. And you get treated, and then you heal as a result of being treated. You don't, if you go into hospital with a broken leg, you don't skip out no matter how many prayers you've said. It's the same with anything. It's the same with the battle in, in your mind. If it's not treated, it's not going to get better. It will fester. The Word of God helps us to treat the lies that we're telling ourselves. And we are telling ourselves lies. We're allowing Satan to tell us lies. So what we need to do is to, is to replace those lies with God's good truth. Because the stuff that God says about you is true. Understanding that God is in control or that God is sovereign is not a reassuring thought until you realise how kind he is. But we, the diagnosis is that we're being attacked by the father of the lies. It's lies against truth. The treatment is God's word and how we choose to, how do we choose to see God, how we choose to believe who God is. And then the healing happens. And maybe, maybe, you'll be, maybe you'll be having a slow healing from whatever you're going through for the rest of your life. But it's better than festering. And it will all be all right in the end. On the other side of glory, it will seem like nothing. We have to choose what we, we choose what we believe. So let's go out today, choosing to believe that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We are not slaves, but sons and daughters. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love. When we choose to believe that, that's when we can start to tell people that there's a really good story out there of hope and joy and peace. And that's when, that's when we'll see our Saviour transformed. And not before time. Amen. 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 I've got some books to sell. Uh, <laughs> I did, I've only got, I can only take cash. But I was. Um, this is my. Um, this is my book. Uh, short, funny book about why I think Jesus makes sense and Christianity makes sense. Um, I had that here last year, and this is my uh, new one: Curious Tales of Redemption. Four short stories for young people of all ages, uh, which was described uh, very nicely by an American blog. It said. Uh, in terms of pure style and imagination, Andy Kind might be the closest thing we have to C.S. Lewis. So that was a very nice thing to say. Now, I don't, my car machine's broken, but they're, five, they're eight pounds in the shop, but five pounds today. If you want either of those, I'll stick around for a bit. Five pounds, two for ten, special or stage community church um, <laughs> option. Um, but either way, it's been a, uh, been a real privilege and pleasure. Uh, thanks for last night. That was amazing. This has been lovely uh, as well. It's always nice to be with you, and uh, hopefully I'll see you next year. Very good. Thank you, Andy. That was great. Bless you for coming and sharing God's word with us. We are going to sing again, and we're going to uh, to use this opportunity to also um, take up our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest with us this morning, please don't feel under any obligation to give. This is something we do as an act of our worship. And uh, but if you'd like to give, of course. That's good, it goes to the ministry and the work of this church. 
and um, it will be would be appreciated. But as I say, please feel under no obligation to give it is part of our worship. We're going to sing together. If you feel comfortable, let's stand again and uh, let's uh, let's praise God as uh, as we bring our service to a close. Jesus because you do love us unconditionally and you do do great things. We thank you Lord in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. It's been great to see you. Fantastic to join together. Please do not rush off unless you really have to because we've got refreshments being served in our coffee shop and we'd love to have some fellowship together. God bless you uh, and uh, trust you have a great week.